it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's very, very special program. We have Kevin Marana, Executive Editor of the Los Angeles Times. Uh, prior to joining the Los Angeles Times, Kevin was a Senior Vice President and edit Editor-in-Chief at ESPN, and he chaired the ESPN Editorial Board. Today's program will be moderated by Tracy Williams, CEO and President of the Olmstead Williams uh, Communications, which provides a uh, focus on public relations, counsel, high growth tech, and healthcare companies. I'd like to welcome our board chair, Linda Bluefetter, and in addition to Tracy Williams, we have Emily Wang and Carl Dickerson from our board of directors. We will be uh, handling questions at, after the moderated discussion, so at that point we'll bring a microphone up to you and be sure to keep uh, your questions in the form of a question versus speeches because I know everybody will have a lot of questions for the editor. So without further ado, Kevin Rada and Tracy Williams. Hello. Hello. Um, Kevin, thanks so much for coming today. So much has been going on in your life in the last week and a half. Uh, when we talked about a month ago, it was right after you won two Pulitzers, making the count 51 total in the history of the LA Times, seven for breaking news stories more than any other newspaper in the United States. So it's been, you know, a very exciting and good year in that way, and then we have this week, <laughs> or you have this week. So um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. It's a rough week. We had a company layoff. I mean, a lot of them have. LAS, as you know, today announced layoffs. Uh, LA Times is laid off 74. So I think the first question I have is this slim down, you know, now that we're slimming down uh, a news organization, how are we going to be managing like digital transformation? Well, first of all, uh, thanks, Kim, for inviting me. And it's great to spend some time chatting with uh, and the board chair and just to be here at the LA uh, World Affairs Council. We're part of, you know, just being here. I recently, uh, you know, celebrated my second anniversary, right? Two years here. LA and you know it's still an honor to leave the LA Times and just to live here. You know, it's it's really I, I love coming to do forums like this and meeting with groups and I I've come anywhere. So those are out there. I, I love meeting with people and just learning because you know the LA Times is an institution in this place, you know, 141 years going on 142. Um, and yeah, it was it was Great, we're celebrating the Pulitzer Prizes, and it's still something to celebrate because it's, it it shows that this institution is uh, important to this community. You know, um, two of those those Pulitzer Prizes were one that had to do with uh, a leaked audio tape um, that resulted in the resignations of, of city council members that were. Textualized that story and breaking that story doesn't happen without LA Times journalists and and also the the Pulitzer for photography feature photography with really in depth portrait of uh, a homeless woman. Um, and so you know that's the good news. The the, the bad news uh, last week we announced layoffs and and it's painful to. Everybody who, who knows those very talented colleagues who work with them, uh, we're losing some, some tremendously talented journalists. There's no way to get around that. And, you know, um, this is a tough time at the LA Times. I think one of the things, if, if you've been around 141 years, you survived a lot. You know, you survived storms, different ownership. Um, and I mean, not just physical storms and earthquakes, but but really uh, challenges to your whole profession, you know. And we're, printing 
process. We were yes. talking about that at our table. Yeah, and, and we're still the largest news organization west of the Mississippi. We're still a very large news organization. We're still here. And really, we're literally fighting for uh, our, you know, our future, you know, and, and that's a fight worth having. Um, you know, so yeah, it was. It's been a rough week. It's not over. Uh, our job is to continue to communicate and and to try to um, move forward, uh, and that's that's what we're trying to do. Um, is it all going to be digital? I think that's the thing that when we talked before, and that's what every you know, all the newspapers. The time has come because Gen Z is digital. Um, it's only people like me that are actually reading a physical paper every day and subscribe to the LA Times and New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and like the feel of the paper. I'll read it online when I'm traveling, but you know, we like it. So we're going away. It's a new generation. Well, yeah, I don't want, I don't want any of you out there to think you need to go away tomorrow, you know? Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, the, the print readership, you know, circulation is going down and there are not a lot of, of uh, of, of print readers that we don't have who love print products. Those who grew up with the habit of reading the newspaper uh, and loving that tactile feel and how it's organized and it's beautifully curated by human beings every day. We call it the daily miracle. It used to. Uh, it's still a precious product for those who like it, but we are really, we are different. You know, we are, we're a digital first newsroom. We're, we're all digital, everybody in media. I don't care if you have a broadcast outlet, you know, a, a cable station, a, a studio, a magazine. We're all reaching digital consumers in the way we have to reach them, and and that's a multitude of ways. Um, and so, par part of the the transformation, we've got to get the revenue to match uh, the 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 ideal. And so, um, and. And, and that's what we're doing. We're trying to do more uh, searching for alternative sources of revenue while we're, you know, in, investing in things that we, that we know work and continue to uh, reach. You talk about Gen Z. Yeah, I mean, the original video. Uh, a lot of, of the way to consume news, we, we, we created a, a social content creation uh, team you know, called the, the 404, um, and operates on social platforms. We, uh, you know, we have a new platform and brand product called Delos that's that's going to be launching soon. It's, it's aimed at trying to reach that audience, and, and we're continuing to try to do things um, that will grow our audience, connect with our community, and, and build it. And, and that, it's a lot. I mean, you're going in so many different places, and as a business, running a business, I know when you're going in all of these different lanes to make it work, it's it's challenging. Is there anything that you see that's like, oh, these are the three things, and we do this, it's the e chain of success? Well, look, it starts first um, with what we, what our core mission is, you know, which is um, news gathering and, and and journalism, original journalism. And so um, we have been in this this city. We have we regularly have a, a accountability and investigator reporting that that helps uh, people know what's going on in in LA and in California. Um, we uh, we just created created a fast break desk. You know, which is aimed at really uh, swarming big breaking news stories and trending topics, and that does very well for us. Uh, building it as an even bigger structure, an engine of, of news. Um, you know, certainly our guides um, that are how to live in LA, you know. To, the greatest uh, 55 best hikes, you know, where to eat. Those uh, are great sections, I love this. How to, how to, yeah, how to even, you know, with utility journalism, you know, people need to know about how to construct ADUs and the, uh, 
what they need to know about city government and and and, and commissions and 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 all kinds of other uh, parts of their lives. And so um, there's a lot that that we do that is uh, in service of of uh, California and how they live, and that's. That's very much a part of the mission too. So that's the um, that underlying theme of journalism. Good journalism is good for business. Yeah, look, we we have to create journalism that people want to pay for, and um, and inspire uh, people to pay for the journalism that is important to them. You know, uh, I think if we if we were not here, there was a lot that people would not know. You know, um, we just had. This city, a uh, council member charge, um, lots of charges, bribery and perjury. Uh, a lot of the reporting of those allegations were done back in 2017, 2019 by our reporters. And, and so there's an accountability function, there's a revelation function to what we do, and and that's that's foundational to any. Yeah, that seems so critical, and the fact that you know it's breaking news now that you did tell us about this as some issue that was coming with this council member uh, several years ago. So that's pretty compelling. When you think about other money, any other ways to get revenue? Because I understand that's the struggle. Um, what about this new legislation where Google and I think Apple are going to have to pay for stories here in California? Is that going to do you see some big revenue spike from that eventually? Well, it passed uh, the assembly a couple, California assembly a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, like five of the, the big tech companies, uh, you know, soak up something like fifty percent of the digital advertising, and I think that you know that they're and it, and it's sort of the facts of a lot of what we produce, and so um, you know, we I, I'm not in that advocacy business, uh, but we have, uh, as a company, we support the legislation as a company, as a business, and, and hopefully, you know, that will, will happen. You know, we think about all these newspapers, you know, the Washington Post has had layoffs and changes, and Jeff Bezos is the one who bought that. Patrick, it, Patrick's is on with the LA Times. You know, it looks like a lot of these news organizations are run, run now or owned by some of the top ones, by the 1% now. In the past, they always made money. Now, Bezos and Patrick Sushan have come in and kind of saved these papers. How long do you think they'll be with it? Are they going to stay with it? Or? Well, look, I, I, I had the, you know, the, the opportunity to work with both of them, right? Because I was at the Washington Post and I was managing there at the time that, that Jeff Bezos bought the Post. You know, Don Graham made a very smart decision to to sell to someone who's very interested in a big track record in, in, in business. And I think, you know, I think he bought it because of um, he was really interested in democracy, and it was very very much important to him. And um, and so he understood the place in the world that that the Washington Post was, and. You know, Patrick Sunshine bought the LA Times, uh, been very committed to it, bought it in 2018, has invested a lot in it, you know, uh, a lot, of, it, it's his personal money, and, um, you know, tens of millions of dollars, you know, uh, continue to invest, but um, we have to become, a, it's, it's not sustainable as a business to continue to have just invest, invest, and lose money. You know, we have to be a profitable place, or at least, you know, make our way to even getting even where the journalism pays for itself. And that's really a challenging time in this environment. It's, it's you know, we we have a downturn in in advertising revenue. You know, uh, at the same time that um, costs are up. You know, cost of of, of, of newsprint, oil, fuel. Um, and, and so it's, it, it's a challenge, but it's not something we can't do. You know, it's, it's really, you have to, to fight through it and, and, and battle out of it. I mean, we have the possibility of, of, of 
you know, new digital revenue, new opportunities. Some there's some good signs of other revenue that's not non-print. Um, our fashion revenue, for instance, is is picked up and all around, and, and some of that is attributed to just having, you know, a new uh, uh, image magazine, which is a uh, you know kind of a, a culturally you know, cool magazine, but that the fashion industry advertises in. And, but we have uh, LA Times Studios. We're trying to build that structure out to, to license and sell more of our IP. And that's more podcasts, or some more podcasts. No, it's, oh. it's, it's really about literally taking the journalism and bringing it to streaming, uh, to streamers, to, to other, could, could be, O and O's, cable outlets, um, other places that may want our journalism, partner with documentary uh, film companies. So the idea would be to take the journalism we have and have it in other platforms. We recently a network, an LA Times network. Hey, right, could 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 be. Who, who knows? Um, but I think you know, as a, as a as just an illustration, we one of the most successful stories, the most successful individual story that that led to conversions. Um, a, a Randall Emmett uh, investigation by two of our reporters, Amy Kaufman and Meg James, that, um, you, you know, it was about Randall Emmett, a producer, and had connections, if anybody out there knows the Vanderpump rules, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, Life that, that all connection. About this. Then um, that was recently, uh, we partnered with ABC News Studios that did a documentary on Hulu recently that aired. And we have some other of our projects in development, uh, some of our journals in, in development, and, and we have plans to kind of accelerate the way in which we can you know, produce our own work for consumption you know, and, and on other platforms. Yeah, murder is big business, right, in journalism. I mean, when there's a murder story, it turns into all kinds of podcasts and shows. You had that big five-part series on that horrible guy down in Orange County. I can't remember what his name was. John. Yes, yeah, dear John. John's one of the early successes for us. Um, yeah, it, it, it was a very big success long before I got here, Christopher Godfrey. But we were one of the pioneers in, in their podcast. Have you read it? Oh, Dear John? Yeah. Yeah. Because it course. scares the heck out of you. Yeah. It's really. I read it, yeah, before, you know, you know, before I got there. I you know, heard Chris, Chris Godford at, at conferences talk about that transition from as a writer to thinking about podcast as a, an initial form. Um, well, back to digital, only because this, I, I think about it because of what's happened at BuzzFeed, they're gone, uh, .LA, which was a tech site that was really useful, they were gone, they were all digital. How, if, we're, if we have to focus on digital, which makes a lot of sense, what is the impact, maybe not just on digital, but overall with AI in the newsroom now? How are you deploying AI in any ways? Well, I think all newsrooms, we're... I, I think with AI, we have to, like, like everybody, everybody who's in the content creation business has to just look at what, what happens with AI. It's, it's, it's something we all have to, 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 to look at and examine. I think we, we're still exploring what we, how to use it, just like other, other newsrooms and companies are. And, and it's, you know, technology continues to advance, and we, we all have to advance with it. So, could you feed in an article and come up with four chat? You feed it into ChatGPT and come up with four posts. I mean, would you do that or not? Look, I, you know, we 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 need to really, um, you know, explore. It's something we talked a lot about of just internally of, of exploring how we we would or would not use uh, AI. But I think every every user every user should be looking at it the same way. So that's a no right now. Oh, we, we, we haven't done that okay. yet, no. Okay. Um, okay, so I have to ask this question. Um, the elephant in the room of Trump. How is the LA Times going to approach covering Trump over the next year? 
because I don't know, there's rules about you've got to cover both candidates, you know, similar times, certainly on the networks, not necessarily in the papers. So you've got a lot to cover there. It can be every day with um, the GOP nominee or potential nominee on the front page every single day in the next year with all of the legal issues coming to Christ. So do you have a policy? Are people talking about it? Like how, as readers, since I have to pick up that newspaper every day and really study it, is that what I'm going to be seeing every day? Well, look, we, we, we've got to cover the, the campaign holistically. You know, Trump, we've had a lot of experience, right, because he was president, and, and certainly the coverage of Trump as president has been critiqued. We, we, you, you know you have to, to fact check in real time more aggressively. Uh, he's also, you know, facing criminal charges, so that's a separate, you know, kind of reporting, and then there are others running against him too, you know, or, or presumably will be. There's no guarantees the, the nominee or, uh, and, and so you, so I, th I think you have to have, and we learned a lot, right, as, a, as an industry from four years in the White House, Trump was, and, and so we have knowledge that we can. So what are the big learnings from that? I mean, is there a Well, I think that, that part of it is, you know, you, you can't simply go down, always go down the rabbit hole and just follow everything that someone is saying all the time and, and then trying to juxtapose it. You, you have to be more, you have to be independent, thoughtful about how you go about covering, you know, um, coverage and, and rigorous. And so, uh, you know, a lot of things, untruths said, and we, we certainly have fact checkers and, and other parts of it, but sometimes those things, those, those vices don't break through it. So the fact checking and in real time, the, the kind of reporting rigor that's needed for, yeah, for someone I, who, who doesn't. I think you guys do, everybody does a great job of fact checking and saying that's not true, but we're, re, we're repeating untruths and then saying they're not true. Do you ever say, heck no, we're not going to run that story? Yeah, I, I, I think so. That, that's about selection and judgment. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you have to cover everything. everything you know, journalism is about making choices and selection of what you cover, what you choose to to write and know, and that's that's part of what you have to apply to to Trump as well. He is a he is a figure of of significance, and so you 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 can't pretend like he doesn't exist. But but I, I think you have to be uh, a lot more rigorous in your assessment of what you cover and and, and how you cover it. And I, I think part of you know, this cycle of campaigning, which we're still in the, the, the midst of uh, sorting out our campaign coverage team, um, you know, will require a lot of, uh, yeah, a, a lot more planning, of, you know, as it relates to covering Trump, too. Okay, so just, you've got this paper, you get to run it. What are your what are your favorite sections? <laughs> Give me some of your well, favorite stories. Tell it again. Oh, really? We can't get a little bit of something I'm that not, gives, not gives you joy. You know, I, I like I like um, I like some of everything we do. You know, I mean, I you know I like the serious things. Uh, you know, I, because I met the, the deputy council from Seoul. Uh, yeah. Deputy Council General there, I was thinking about Max Kim's recent story where I corresponded, you know, about uh, how schools in South Korea and rural areas are, they're, they're, they're dying because of the, the change in South Korean families, you know, are smaller. There's no kids. I thought yeah, it was a great that, story. Yeah, it's very, you know, so, so it's, it's, you know, it's everything from that. Every time we do really rigorous, you know, investigative reporting. I love the, our, our Canada series, which was a Pulitzer finalist. It, it took something that was a big topic like legal weed and, and really examined it and the exploitation and um, lots of things that happened to farm workers. And, and it, just, it just put a light on, on something that is a really big part of the change in culture, legalized marijuana and, and California being a leader. So, 
you know, love our columnists and our voices, you know. I mean, you know, the Lopez and Bennett of New Column, ain't the elderly, I was talking to the gentleman over there, he said he's 85. Carl Dickerson, yes. Carl, yeah, so I was thinking about when we were talking, you know, that there's a big population, Steve, really, you know, he's been one of the America's greatest columnists, but, you know, at this stage, changed, uh, you know, created an entire different column form, but, but like everything that uh, you know, I love, so much of everything we do, and and there are features of music coverage, uh, lots of you know, it's just so much you know. Food, you're hitting everything. on you're hitting all of some yeah, of my I mean, favorite like, stories yeah, recently. I could, so I could go I could go on and on. It's a it's a tremendous it's a tremendous news organization, and it's it's filled with with really some of the most talented journalists in the country. And, it's an honor to work with them. Uh, so Carl pitched an idea earlier to Kevin. Carl said that the largest growing demographic in the country is over 80, or the fastest growing. Is that right? Right. So he wants a larger print version. So <laughs> Kev Kevin is taking it. Uh, I was going to say we could do something with the e-paper for you. You know, uh, get that e-paper to you and can expand it to look like just look like a newspaper. So it goes to you, but then you're going to have to do the distribution for them because they, they're going to need some help. So. Okay, well, we're about ready to take questions from the audience. Fantastic. Well, we've got three right over here. The, somebody with a the microphone? There's three gentlemen. If you'll stand up and tell us your name. To you, please. Norman Peterson. When I turn on Spectrum News, or I turn on my Spectrum cable sta uh, delivery station, the first thing I get is Spectrum News, and very often that's the LA Times. What is the nature of your arrangement with Spectrum, and is that kind of the beginning of a LA Times station? Well, we have, it's, it's LA Times today. Uh, and that's a show, we have a one hour show on Spectrum and, and so we have a partnership with Spectrum and we help produce that show, it's mostly, you know, it's produced there, so it's a partnership and you, we, we have our journalism on uh, Spectrum and it's a, it's a great, uh, great partnership in a way to extend our journalism to that cable audience. So, uh, and we've done some special things there like, you know, we have ideas to expand it, and we've had town halls, and you know something that we get we could do special programs. So it's it's a it, it is a great relationship. Uh, Joel Bellman, uh, SPJ LA Board of Directors. Um, why doesn't the LA Times simply eliminate its print product and save all the production costs and go full digital? And I'm not being facetious. Well, look, you, you, you highlight a challenge that, that you have right there, which is that, um, you know, we still get like 70% of our revenue, you know, from, from print. And so you're, you're in the process of making a, a transition where you're growing digital revenue. You have both, you have both costs associated with the print process, you're right, like you, you could, you eliminate print, you know, you reduce the cost, but you've also reduced the revenue, and so you've got to grow the revenue simultaneously, increase subscription. So first thing I'd say, and my wife is always telling me, does everyone here have a, have a subscription to LA Times? Um, That's, I wanted to ask that question. And, and, Who and, doesn't? And no one, don't, you know, no one has to raise their hand, you know. But, oh no, I we, think we should. But we, but we have to, yeah, we, part of it is we, we have to grow subscriptions. You know, we have to grow digital subscriptions. That's, that's a mission. And, and you, lots of newspapers have had this tension where circulation is going down, very rapid decline. Uh, digital, you know, subscriptions are growing, but the revenue are not at the same pace, right? And so we got to, increase that the most direct way is to get digital subscriptions 
And, uh, and then we have to have other things, partnerships, other sources of revenue, uh, new ideas, new creative things that we can, can bring revenue to our place. But you know, at some point there won't be a, a print paper. You're, you're right. I mean that that time will come. You know, it, it's you know it, it's. Uh, but right now it's still generating revenue, and we've got to replace that revenue. Yeah, I mean we're probably just years away, right? For, that it will all be digital. I mean. Yeah. Look, I I, I think we we have a, 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 a digital mindset, a digital ethos, that we have digital products, and but we've got to get more digital subscribers. Hi, Jim Graham. Um, if I were pitching a story, I would pitch the decline of civics education, and both the LA Times covers that. But my question relates to my time as a public administrator at City of Los Angeles. We were uh, working on different programs. In one case, I was able to save the city at half a million dollars a year, and my colleagues likewise. Went to your reporters, the Daily News, and was blatantly told, uh, we don't want to hear about your successes, we only report your failures. I think that narrative has to change, and I think that faulty narrative is related to what we're seeing today in the attitudes towards government and those of us in public administration, as they call us now, the deep state. Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the, the question. I, I'll just say broadly, you know, I do think that, you know, first, I, I think there's certainly a role that, that news organizations play in holding public officials accountable, and, and that's, that's important for society and democracy. But it's also important, you know, that we, we tell a range of stories. I, I, I know that to be true. One, one of the things that the decline of, of, of some news readership, I think, is a product sometimes of people, just, just the weight of news. You know, there's just so much bad news and things happening and people just feel like a weight of it that they want to escape it. And unfortunately, we have some serious cleavages and problems in our society, misinformation, disinformation. We have things like mass shootings now. They, they become, they, they're so regular now that they're normalized almost. And it's, it's really, and, and yet we know in the broader society, like people are doing amazing things to inspire us every day. You know, they, they make you smile, right? you know, great feats. And, and we've got to capture more of that, you know, we've got to capture more of that in our life that, to, to give ourselves some inspiration, right? Like, and because there are these great stories out there, you know, we were at, when I was at the Washington Post, we started something called Inspire Life, you know, a, a, a vertical that really was just about things of inspiration. And, uh, you know, I've, I've talked a little bit about what, what's our version of that here. Um, you know, someplace regularly where people can be inspired because I, I think that's part of also, you know, fueling, you know, readers who want to to see themselves represented, you know, in the LA Times. Like, that, that's one of the things you hear about all the time, representation. You know, this is uh, a incredibly diverse place. Like, all of these diasporas, lots of languages, spoken people come here you know you, you know fulfill their dreams it's it's, it's the, the the 21st century melting pot right it's, it's a place where people come and you know, in some ways with with la where you know people are are thinking about it in the same way they're thinking about the the news media right but but i hope that um we can be a a civic catalyst, right? We it, it's important for us to be here uh, for all of it. And uh, I was having dinner with last night with somebody that you know, a couple of uh, you know, uh, public relations executives. One of them had said said that you know, uh, man, if the LA Times is if the LA Times is gone, I might go. 
which uh, that's right. Yeah, that she had grown up reading it all of her, her life. So I'll get another subscription. You know, you, you want it to be here for the next generation and the next generation, and, and that's that's what we're fighting to do. Uh, one, one of the things I'll say about being an editor, you know, I'm in the listening mode. You know, I'm I'm here to listen. You know, I. I you know, you you also can't be in the thin skin business. That's what I say in all this staff. Like that's our job to be critiqued and assessed and examined. And um, and I take that. That's part of how you learn and get better. And and I hope we build more audience based on feedback. And and so that's what we're trying to do. I think Kevin is saying, pitch him some stories. You can send him via email about what good things you're doing. Kevin at LA Times .com. So. This gentleman over here had his hand up for quite some time. Uh, Rick Curcio, um, it, I noticed that uh, your, uh, or at least it seems to me, that your national and international coverage seems to be uh, going more and more with use of, of uh, stories like from the AP and things like that, which are, which are good stories. On the other hand, I, I think you're doing a really good job of covering state and local news. Um, and I'm curious as to, as to how you see that progressing and also helping other uh, local news media in other cities uh, that, that don't have your coverage. I mean, 30 years ago, the LA Times every Thursday had a special section for the South Bay where we live. Um, that doesn't exist anymore. So I'd be very curious to see your thoughts about helping local news continue to do better because they're under tremendous cost pressure too. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think we're there, and we sometimes have partnerships with other news organizations, and we do some things together. We and that's still available. We we partner with university, uh, you know, journalism students. Uh, we have. Uh, lots of ways to, and foundations are very much of a part of, of how we sustain the core right journalism. We recently had a, a new one on early childhood education, so we could, we could uh, with a foundation partnership and, and, and add to coverage of, of uh, early childhood education is important. Um, but if I'm, if I'm under, understanding your question about Local news. Local news is a is a pillar of what the LA Times does. It's our lar largest staff, right? Metro, Metro slash California. It is our largest staff, and you know it's it's foundational to to who we are as the LA Times. Obviously, you know we're not. You know LA is so huge and sprawling. You know that we we can't cover it like a local local paper, right? And you know, we can't even cover that like the, the Boston Globe covers Boston. I mean, they cover the region, but they're, it's much smaller in territory. Here, it's huge and sprawling. And so you have to be strategic about themes and, and trying to you cover the most important things, but also kind of connecting dots and in, in making sure something that might be happening in, you know, San Gabriel Valley might be uh, applicable to um, the rest of, of, of Greater Los Angeles, you, you're finding stories and trying to 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 highlight something that will connect to, to connect that sometimes. And so it's a very complex, you know, formula. Um, but I think uh, as the the biggest news organization in, in California, we're you know we're always open to to partnerships. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rod Amos. I'm a contributing writer with the Los Angeles Sentinel and the LA Watch Times. Thank you so much for being here today, Kevin. Appreciate you. Thank you. My question is, sir, what are the most important lessons you've learned in your career and how have they influenced your managerial style? Thank you. Well, I, I, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, I, I think part of it was just you know, I, uh, you know, you start with your family, you know, um, 
my dad was a geologist, paleontologist, pursued a career in the 1950s, you know, at a time when black men didn't have those kind of aspirations. A lot of them, he didn't have any role models. Um, he was an adventurer, um, just loved rocks. And a time when, you know, you know, if you were, you know, growing up in Wichita, Kansas, if you were a young black kid then, you know, I don't know that you think, well, well how am I gonna get that career, right? Like, people are telling him, going to something like teaching, you know, which is, was part of my family. And, uh, you know, my uncle, I mean, my, my grandfather was a school principal, my, my aunt was a teacher, and, and my father kind of went out on this limb. Lot, it took him a long time to get to that, you know, a lot of rejection. And, and, and finally, that's how I got to D.C., you know, went to, uh, he finally got a job uh, labeling specimens at the U.S. Geological Survey, you know, and, uh, and moved, you know, on his own, you know, to go out and try to pursue this career. And left the family back in Wichita, that's, and, and so he could save up with that money, then we came. So, struggled for a long time. Um, and so that was part of the, the, you know, you start with your foundation, your family, what example they, they share for you. You know, one of the things that my grandfather used to always say is that everybody has, every, everybody has something to offer. And so, part of when I think about the style is not to look past people. You know, that, that if you're running a newsroom, um, everybody's important. Sometimes ideas bubble up, and if you're always just talking to the top people and certain people, then you don't have that sense of, of what everyone can offer. You miss some things. Uh, and so, for me, that, that starts with the influence. I had a lot of other people who, um, during the course of just, uh, you know, we all have mentors, right? I'm sure you probably have it, you know, you're, Contributor to the LA Sentinel, which is by the way, great newspaper, part of the tradition of black newspapers in the, in the country. And, and so I'm mindful of all of that, I, uh, all, all of that history, that and struggle and that came before I got here. And you always kind of have that in the back of your mind, the people who paved the way. And a lot of those people, most of those mentors, a lot of them are no longer, you know, are no longer with us, you know. Bob Maynard was the first, talking about California, Bob Maynard was the first um, uh, editor, the first black editor of a, of a daily. I was, I was around when that was, when he was, he got named and, uh, to that, and, and it was in a, in a program that he ran, you know, in California, you know, the Maynard Institute summer program for minority journalists. And so, you know, these things that happen, you know, are, um, you know, you always in the back of my mind, and and, uh, and uh, I don't know if I answered your question. But thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Do we have time for another question? Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Fiona Hutton. I'm a public and nurse consultant, and I'm also an LA City uh, Recreation Parks Commissioner. Um, my question is, oh, oh, first of all, I want to thank you. Your top lists saved me and my husband of 25 years on date night selections. <laughs> all right. 25 years ago, that's really hard. <laughs> so like best coffee houses, best tacos, all those things are really good when you need a, a, a helpful hint. My question is on ethics. Um, as you've had to look at different platforms, um, you have journalists doing different things. So I grew up in the day when we had beat reporters and it was a beat reporter just to been a beat reporter. And now you have reporters that also are on Twitter and some of them have opinion pieces or you know, you've got newsletters and you've got things like this and they're kind of wearing two hats and flexing two muscles. How do you help them figure out from an editorial perspective the ethics of separating the two sides of their brain as they're trying to stick to the reporting side, but having a mandate probably to help with, with having, candidly, an opinion that is not just on the opinion page. You know, it's a very good question because I think opinion has evolved. I think in the, in the age of the internet that, uh, you know, voice has been 
emphasize more. We, we have essays, we have lots of, we used to just have analysis in the print place of might be label analysis and that was kind of perspective. But we have a lot more voice, we encourage voice. I think digital consumers, in fact, I think they, they, they want voice, they want opinion. It's, it's you know, tricky, we, we label it on our site right now. Not everyone does that all across the, the internet. We label things to say column. We try to get people identifiable markers. When you get to social, you know, social platforms and the, and the scrums and skirmishes are out there on social, um, we, we have guidelines. We have, we have generally guidelines for the newsroom on how to behave, ethical guidelines in, in every space. And those are constantly being updated, you know, for the times and, and for things we haven't thought about. I think, I think the idea is to try to be as transparent with the public as possible um, without, you know, I, not a big fan policing everything everyone does, you know, in their own space. And I think that, that balance, you know, as, as what, we, what we allow people to do as human beings to, to be citizens of the world, versus the responsibility they have working for the Los Angeles Times and how that will be perceived. I always, you know, ask people, do no harm, you know, do do nothing that will hurt your colleagues and your profession and, and, and the place where you work. Um, and so, you know, it's a very tricky, everybody who looks at these guys, looked at guidelines. I happened to, the last time I was at ESPN, when I was at ESPN, I, I chaired the editorial board, which is basically the board that looks at guidelines. I, I was the, the drafter of our social media guidelines, and it, it's very hard to carve out something that works for everybody. And, and so you, you, you really want people to understand that like how you're perceived is important uh, by, by the public, and to think that through, you know, when, when you're out there in the, in the spaces, you know, giving your thoughts about this and that. My name is Emily Wang. Um, I was a journalist before, and I detoured to uh, marketing and communication financial services industry. Uh, my thought and question is that nowadays things are very different. Most everyone has an account on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and all these uh, social media platforms. And most everyone claims they can produce content by a photo and maybe a few lines. So my question to you, Kevin, would be, should we redefine journalism? If yes, how will you define journalism? And for the people that still have passion, great passion for journalism, do they still have a career? When everybody claim they're a content producer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, our, our craft has expanded. You know, we, we have people in the profession now that, that you, you did, we've, we've created lots of new jobs in our profession, you know, all kinds of jobs that, it, you know, we, we have uh, audience teams and animators and, and illustrators like data specialists. We, we have lots of different kinds of jobs now and, you know, embedded video teams and then we had ever before we're doing a lot more so you know some of the same kind of people that are in the creative community you know which is a term in, in Los Angeles that everybody will, will, will recognize you know we're we're part of that sometimes in the creative community but journalism is is a, a professional craft and it has some principles it has values it has rigor you know you you there's a way to do it you can't walk off the street, out of the street, and say I'm a journalist. You know, you, you can say it, but that doesn't mean it's true. Uh, and so, you know, it's still, you know, it's not for everybody. Everybody can't go uh, and and dig into uh, public records and 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 find and, and ask questions and and get answers and knock on doors and. Uh, you know, do enough research that 
and then put a story together that is fair and and can meet the legal tests and 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 also uh, is it it's something that's not that that everyone can't do and you know it does start with reporting and and so I do think that uh, the journalism schools are still going to be filled you know there's still going to be people coming to know how to do that how to practice journalism so I don't think. It, we have a lot of other, we can continue to expand it, and we should, you know. We, we should continue to evolve, and it has to evolve. Uh, but there are some fundamental principles that I don't think will change, you know. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't, you know, they've stood the test of time. And a lot of people attack journalism. You know, this is not the first series of attacks. As long as I've been here, you know, people have been attacking, reporting, and journalism, but we're still here, it's, it's still the test of time. And that that means that it is important, you know, to a functioning democracy. If it wasn't here, it'd be chaos. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. My name is Christina Pascucci. I'm also a member of the media for local TV news. And uh, kind of piggybacking off what you just said and her question, I think uh, journalists are a pillar of democracy and what they have that content creators don't is a trained eye to determine if something's a deep fake or if there's a video we have to vet it. So our job remains very important in determining what's truth from fiction, especially if there's a fight for the truth right now more than ever. So my question is, as I see my own newsroom and other newsrooms across Los Angeles, being spread thin, there are fewer people in the newsroom. Each person is required to do more jobs. I think there's recently cuts announced at LA Times. If you could address that, I'd, I'd love to hear from your perspective. But how do you uphold and guarantee the quality of journalism that we've seen in the past so that we remain relevant and necessary? Well, no, thanks for the question. I mean, it's, look, I've, I've been around, I think this is 44 years for me now. And so, you know, I've, I've been in places that were once big and you know large and thriving, and then are small and shell of themselves. Uh, we've had a, a, a decline, a, a death of a lot of newspapers. I think twenty five hundred in the last ten years, and so that that's a real threat to our democracy to decline. But but we're here, you know, and and. And I know we had layoffs at 500, so we had 500 person newsroom. Um, like it's larger than than we've had. Um, still the largest news organization in the West, you know. Um, and and we're we'll, we're still here, you know. And and so part of it, of fighting for the, the 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 future is 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 to really we've got to do fewer things that people don't want and increase the things that people want and convince people they have to have us. You know, we, we, we've got to have the LA Times and that's that's on us some and, and we've got to summon all our creativity and ingenuity and, and all of the genius we have in our newsroom and across our company to find new ideas and new ways to, to, uh, to make money and sustain it. And, and so it, it is essential. Um, I think the quality of the LA Times is is, is amazing. You know, I'm, I'm biased. It's it's. I it's, agree. I think a lot of people in the room would agree. It's, it's one of the, I, and I think you know that I think we get better and better. And and I think um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's great. It's not to be taken for granted that you know we have one of the elite journalistic organizations in, in the country, um, not the world. And so, you know, I, I think it's important for us to be here, and I, and I think anything that that a lot of us who have been in this business, anything we can do to strengthen local journalism, we're all for it. We all kind of talk about the same thing, like how can we strengthen our community of journalism, you know, across the country, because that's, it's important for, for, the, for everyone. Hi, I'm an 
Andrea Grossman, and I, I'm piggybacking on the AP question. You just said you have to convince people that they have to have the LA Times. Um, the LA Times always had this really great international coverage, but how do you convince people that they have to have the LA Times when they can get AP anywhere? Yeah. That's, you know, that's yeah, I think I missed the quote. You're right. I, didn't, I don't think I answered that part. I missed your part. Apologies. Now, but now I'll get a second chance here. Um, well, part of it is how can you be distinctive? I mean, we're at a place where we don't have a 1,200 person neutral. You know, we're, we're, we don't have foreign bureaus all around the world. I don't think that that's going to be, you know, returns, right? And so, you, you try to focus on where you have an impact. And I think in this really crowded media space, we have to, to, to say, well, where can we have differentiation? Where can we do something special? You know, our, our foreign um, reporting is concentrated in Latin America and, and in uh, uh, the Pacific Rim. And so, uh, currently, currently a, a, a correspondent in Taiwan that is you know, trying to get you know, in, in China. Uh, we have someone with a visa in, in, in China, and I, I mentioned in Seoul, and we have, you know, uh, correspondents in Mexico. You know, we we cover the world, that things that are very important. Um, you know, our our photo, our, one of our photo journalists who's a photo for a correspondent, um, you know, won the top prize in, in, in photography from the uh, Overseas Press Club for coverage of the first 30 days of Ukraine war and won the Pulitzer Prize last year for his coverage of Afghanistan. Uh, and so we have, we, we go to stories that are important for our audience here and, and, and for every audience and then we try to really chisel what what is important. The, the AP, if they're out in a lot of places and they do great work, you know, we can we can put those stories in paper, and they do great work. Put them in, and, that, and that's that's still fine. They, they, we we curate them, and, and so and save our our correspondents for things that they can really do special and distinguishing. And and I say that about a lot of the coverage. I mean, we we really can't do every single thing. You know, we have to really you know you have to sharpen what we go after, and that's that's important where we can make a difference and, and have an impact and have expertise that no one else has. And I'm just gonna point out one thing. I think every news or every major newspaper that we read is making, they have to do this calculus every day just like you do, right? A a absolutely, and um, you know, we look, we're, we're, you know, we're focusing, it takes something like a big industry, like the entertainment industry, you know, it's, 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 it has global reach, and uh, it's anchored here. And so that's an area where, you know, we have really have, have plans to, to uh, even enlarge and expand that coverage because um, that has a lot of advantages for us here. We're, we're, we, we know the people here, we're anchored here, we have our own court advantage here, and it also has, like, global appeal. You know, I liken it to the way the Washington Post covers the federal government, you know. Or New York us. covers New York and yeah. international us. markets. They're Washington, I mean, the Wall Street Journal, it's financial. Yeah, exactly. And, and so we ought to be dominant. We do a lot of great things there, but we can be even more dominant in, in the entertainment space. Well, I think we have time. Oh, end of program. That was our last. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> Well, I can't thank you enough for being here. It is, um, you need to come at least every six months because no. we learn so much from you. Well, thank you, Tracy. Uh, appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all of you.